Good afternoon. My name is Bridget Keown, and I am a lecturer in the Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies program at the University of Pittsburgh, where I also serve as a member of the Horror Studies Working Group. Uh, I want to start off by thanking Sam for creating this space and giving me a chance to talk with you today, and I really look forward to sharing a few thoughts on queer ghosts and hauntings, but also um, to get your ideas and think through these issues with you as well. Now, I just promised we were gonna start by talking about queer ghosts um, and the related genres of the Gothic and horror. But the more I've worked on this issue and thought about uh, the question of queer hauntings, the more I realize that this is a problem that transcends and crosses genres. So I wanna start with a more conventional thriller narrative to get us started. Uh, just to note, we are going to be discussing spoilers from the final episode of Killing Eve, which is probably something of an open secret at this point, considering that the finale aired in May of this year and discussions almost immediately popped up in my classroom on the internet and trending worldwide on Twitter. Um, but the finale reopened a long, emotional, and painful discussion of the barrier gaze trope that continues to limit the potential and agency of queer characters in mo many types of narrative that surround us. This trope is devastating to generations of fans who rely on this representation for help navigating their own identity, assurances that they will have a happy ending, and promises that they will not be forgotten after they died. So for those who aren't familiar with the show, Eve is an MI5 agent who was fired for taking on clandestine investigations and takes an undercover job with MI6 in order to hunt down Villanelle, a ruthless international assassin who works for a secret organization called the Twelve. Over the course of four seasons, Eve and Villanelle engage in an obsessive, possessive relationship that makes them both question their life's choices, their future goals, as well as the real reasons why they continue to be part of each other's lives. In the series finale, Eve and Villanelle enact a scheme to liberate both of themselves from the organizations that control them and have a brief moment to hurriedly consummate their desire for each other in an embrace, only for Villanelle to be struck down by a sniper's bullet while Eve screams in terror. Villanelle hardly has time to respond to the shot, except to run with Eve to the relative safety of the River Thames. Indeed, the camera barely shows us the face of either woman after the shot, and the highly stylized ending in the water offers neither a chance to speak and it making it almost impossible for them to sustain eye contact. This is just a shot of the end, um, the words which kind of slam into view uh, following Villanelle's death. Now, there are any number of problems with this ending. As Caroline Framke explains in Variety, it was a lazy and a rushed choice. As she notes, quote, the whole thing is so abrupt, so hackneyed, so amazingly unoriginal that for one hopeful minute, I was sure it had to be a trick. It's so jarring that it feels like a slap in the face, end quote. For others, however, who saw Eve and Villanelle a multicultural, morally complex, and magnetically engaging queer couple, this ending was emotionally devastating. In a piece for them, Sarah Clements talks about Villanelle's death as it happened, quote, with no moment of pause before it faded to black. There was no closure, end quote. Instead, viewers were forced to negotiate a closing scene where both heroines, both protagonists, the two halves of one narrative whole, were rendered into nothing more than bodies. One who was alive, but was so overwhelmed that she was almost soulless with grief, and one floating in the Thames, blood spread out behind her like angel wings. And that's the image that you see in the slide right here where you see a, a white woman with blonde hair who's floating in the water with her eyes closed. And because she's been shot in the back twice, there are two uh, streams of blood that are coming out behind her. Um, and as they diffuse in the water, they look like angel wings. It should be noted that Villanelle's redemption arc through Christian religious practices played a major theme in the season finale. And thus the angel wings are more than visually appealing. There is an implication here that Villanelle has achieved through martyrdom, the kind of heroism she never could in life. As I said, Killing Eve is not a horror story, or at least not in the conventional sense, and therefore might be an odd place to start a discussion about queer ghosts. 
However, I would argue that the show's finale, as well as fans' reactions to it, provide a strong framework for our discussion as about queer ghosts and specifically their almost total absence from, their, from the narratives that surround us. This presentation is a distillation of a much larger, much messier work um, that hopefully will soon be an article, but is a project with tentacles that reach in multi-directions. It's an emotional and theoretical work that touches on a number of genres and disciplines without settling comfortably anywhere, or perhaps discomforting everyone, kind of like ghosts themselves. Um, but basically what I want to do is to recognize that queer people almost never get afterlives, not only in Gothic or horror stories, but in other genres as well. And I want to understand why. Why is it that so many haunted houses are populated with heterosexual yet incorporeal beings? Why is queer desire, whether romantic, sexual, or otherwise, so tied to the corporeal that it cannot exist after death in the way that heterosexual desire can. Why is queer death final? What are the purposes of ghosts in the stories we tell? How would the presence of queer ghosts change these stories and change us as we imbibe them? So we'll start with horror. Um, and while I promise I will get to a coherent narrative shortly, I do just wanna take a moment to think about where the question of queer ghosts first possessed me. Uh, and that was when I had a chance to teach the 1983 film, The Hunger, directed by Tony Scott. There we go. Uh, and starring Catherine Deneuve, Susan Sarandon, and David Bowie. This was part of the University of Pittsburgh's Queer Horror Week programming during the year of 2021. Uh, we hosted a watch party of the film as well as a community discussion based around it. Um, and brought up the issue of the way in which death and undeath is portrayed. The film is a strange overwrought adaptation of Whitley Stryber's 1981 book, which is in many ways an homage and a challenge to Anne Rice's 1976 interview with the vampire. Both ver versions tell the story of Miriam Blaylock, played by Catherine Deneuve, a vampire whose life began in ancient Egypt, but both stories largely focus on the end of her relationship with John, played by David Bowie, who is a human male whom she seduced about two centuries prior. John is dying, we are told. And as such, Miriam begins a new romance with Dr. Sarah Roberts, played by Susan Sarandon, a doctor obsessed with finding a cure for aging and death. It might be worth noting that in the book, Miriam is interested in Sarah because her research may provide the key to prolonging John's life, but in the film, their attraction is shown as both mutual and selfish insofar as the two women forsake others to be with each other. And the poster that you see on the screen here is one of the posters advertising the film. Um, it is as overwrought as the film itself. So it's a, a black background with yellow text that reads The Hunger. Um, and in the center is a extremely pale woman uh, who is reaching with her arms outstretched and bending her head backwards so that her face appears upside down. Uh, that is Miriam played by Catherine Deneuve. And on either side of her are a white man with blonde hair and a white woman with dark hair um, who are David Bowie and Susan Sarandon's characters respectively. Miriam, it is probably important to note as we move forward, is not and has never been human. Vampires are close to, but a different species in the world of the hunger. As such, Miriam does not and cannot turn her human companions, both men and women, though they receive a profoundly expanded life through drinking her blood and the blood of other humans. Ultimately, we learn they all must begin aging and eventually wither to skeletal shells. Their curse is not to be undead then, but to be undying. They cling to consciousness even as their bodies age beyond the point of being recognizable. Unable to kill her lovers and put them out of their suffering, Miriam entombs them in coffins and stores them in the attic along with some very elegant decorative pigeons. In the novel, Streber describes John once he joins the ranks of the undying as quote, neither dead nor alive, somehow still attached to this ruined corpse, a spirit perhaps unwanted among spirits and forced to remain in the dead house of its body, end quote. And in this slide, we see uh, two film stills from The Hunger on the left-hand side, 
there is the progression of uh, John portrayed by David Bowie aging rapidly. So he starts off as a middle-aged man uh, with thinning hair and glasses, and he progresses to being elderly with stubble and losing a lot of his hair to his final iteration where he is extremely withered, uh, faded and bald. And on the right-hand side uh, is a picture of that same uh, withered male corpse in a white uh, linen suit laying in a wooden coffin. And besides that is kneeling a white woman with blonde hair wearing a gray blouse. Um, and there are lots of decorative doves uh, filling the scene as well. In the passage that I described from The Hunger, the bodies of Miriam's human companions, again, men and women both, are themselves described as haunted houses of sorts, dead yet possessed of and or by a spirit. It's a description for me that harkens back to the last line of Shirley Jackson's The Haunting of Hill House, quote, and whatever walked there walked alone, end quote. Whatever consciousness these individuals possess must exist on its own, tormented by the physical potential of embodiment, but powerless to perform any bodily acts themselves. John recalls being haunted by the faces of those he has killed during his own hunger and remembering the fact that Miriam said, quote, there was no touch with the dead, end quote, and the touch is in italics in the text. These lines and the concept of death in this story literally haunted me. Why were Miriam's lovers condemned to this endless suffering? Traditionally, even the undead die, right? So what was going on here? In looking at scholarship around the film, I noticed that a number of scholars have read The Hunger within the context of the early years of the outbreak of HIV AIDS in North America and its simultaneous fashion with and fascination with and repulsion for blood as well as non-heteronormative sexual relationships. Throughout the story of The Hunger, vampires are synonymous with quote users or quote junkies who appear quote strung out and desperate to the point of death if they are unable to get the fix that they need. Likewise, John is left to age and die in a hospital while surrounded by doctors and nurses who pay him no mind. A contemporary review highlighted the similarities between John's experiences and those of quote, gay men during Reagan's reign when nothing is being done to research a treatment for AIDS, end quote. So in the framework of this reading, we can most certainly see the hunger conforming to the bury your gaze or your queers trope, where two characters who are responsible for seducing quote, innocent humans are denied the fulfillment and partnership they so desperately crave and are confined to a moldering eternity in their attic coffins. Moreover, John's murder of a child over the course of the film emphasizes that his nature specifically is perverse and is inherently dangerous to the young. But vampires are our quintessentially queer monsters with their overwhelming seductive powers, their frequent and non-traditional forms of penetrating their victims or partners and their campiness. But John is not a vampire, certainly not in the same way as Miriam who was born herself of a vampire. In both the text and the film version of The Hunger, John's inherent humanity is emphasized. He has to use a cross-shaped weapon, for example, to cut the throat of one of his victims because he does not have the biological tools needed to bite them. Thus, it is his association with Miriam, his human queerness, both in terms of his unnaturally extended life and the relationship that defines his existence that condemns him to this fate of unending corporeality. So to understand why and how John must suffer, I think it's important to think about tropes, public health, and philosophy. So let's begin. In our discussions, I do want to clarify what I mean when I use the word queer. Queer is at once an identity category that has been reclaimed by members of the LGBTQIA community to represent an op opposition to various definitions of normal. While this generally is rooted in concepts of heterosexuality, meaning that those who identify as queer understand themselves as specifically not heterosexual, it can also refer to different theoretical oppositions to things like gender binaries or norms, languages around gender or sex, normative definitions of relationships or family, or consider also to expand into issues of capitalism, economy, and time itself. 
to queer something means to apply aspects of queer theory, a branch of critical theory that emerged in the 1990s that very broadly challenges our assumptions of normal. Typically, queer theory questions assumptions around sex and gender, but is also used to trouble notions of normality in just about any sphere we can think of. I will be using queer as both an adjective and a verb in the course of this talk, meaning that we'll be talking about people who identify as queer or as members of the LGBTQIA community, as well as troubling our assumptions about normality in this world and the next. My central arguments are first, that the unrelenting focus on queer people's bodies and the physicality of their sexual acts has made it impossible to imagine such an identity existing without a physical form. Secondly, I argue that queer ghosts are some of the most disruptive forces for good that I can consider and deserve to be heard and represented across narratives. So the first and most ready reading of John's fate is the barrier gaze trope that we've been circling for a few minutes now. To use a definition proposed by Haley Hulin and Danielle DeMuth, the barrier gaze trope refers to a theme employed at least as early as the 19th century in which a same gender couple suffers the death of one of their partners, usually tragically and graphically, and usually following the acknowledgement of deep or complex feelings for the other. In some cases, the living partner realizes that they were, quote, never actually gay, end quote, once the um, suggestions of the dead character are removed from them, and they return to a heterosexual partner for comfort and fulfillment. Stoker's Dracula is a good example of this, with the romance of our vampire hunting men ending in Quincy Morris's death, and Jonathan Harker returning to his fiance Mina to live a life of fulfilled heterosexuality. In other issues, however, especially in modern iterations of the trope, both characters and the audience are forced to cope with the death of at least one member of a couple without closure, compassion, or a sense that life goes on afterwards, such as we saw at the end of Killing Eve, or we have also seen in things like The Stand or in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the list goes on. As Hulan and DeMuth explain, the trope originally offered, and this is the quote that is displayed on the slide as well, quote, a way for gay authors to write about gay characters without coming under fire for breaking laws and social mandates against the endorsement of homosexuality. And two examples that we can use to think about this are the picture of Dorian Gray, uh, which is uh, shown on the left-hand side of the screen. It's the frontispiece of uh, an edition of the picture of Dorian Gray showing a wood carving of Dorian as a, an old and ugly man standing before the picture of his young and beautiful self with the corporeality of both of them emphasized. And the picture on the right is a black and white image um, that has been used in an illustration of Melmoth the Wanderer um, by Charles Maturin, featuring a tall uh, hooded man standing on the road to a ramshackle house with smoke coming out of the chimney uh, and rain falling around them. So if we start with Dorian Gray and Melmoth the Wanderer as our examples, we can think of how in both cases, the villains or anti-heroes at the center of the novel are portrayed as charming, but in a highly pernicious way. Their desires are too horrible to be spoken. Indeed, John Melmoth's questions can never actually be verbalized in a clear or loud way. He is forever whispering to his intended victims or muttering to them through window shutters, but dies without managing to corrupt a soul. And again, this uh, emphasis on corrupting the young runs throughout these texts. Dorian Gray quite literally had to have whole scenes excised, leaving readers with tantalizing and terrifying ellipses in the text that implied as much as they obscured. This works closely with uh, Mayor Rigby's subversive readings of the Gothic, where much of the tension of the story, quote, appears to be based on a sense of a secret encounter in which the text brings to light something that ought to be repressed something that feels particularly pertinent to people whose identities, bodies, and desires have been culturally designated queer, end quote. 
It is through the gaps in the structure of a story, whether narratively based or texturally based, that the uncanny can be seen. But the relationship between the uncanny and the queer is a complicated one that I think needs to be further explored, articulated, and forcibly evolved. For example, in a piece entitled Queering the Yellow Wallpaper, Jonathan Crew notes how many times the word queer, as well as synonyms like strange, are used and how their repetition breaks down their meaning, much like how repeating the same word over and over again makes the word sound strange and foreign to our ears. Crew argues that this process essentially queers the word queer by forcing readers, quote, to the social construction of categories of normalcy and deviancy, end quote, represented by these words. In his work on haunted domestic spaces in 19th century short stories, Jeffrey Andrew Weinstock also equates, or more precisely, derives the queer from the uncanny. When a space is haunted, it becomes denaturalized and normality dissolves. The fear of haunted spaces is that, is that they are locations where anything can happen. And Weinstock argues that that includes new, different and or transgressive sexual behaviors, quote, or erotic identities, constructions of gender, forms of knowledge, modes of self-construction and practices of community, end quote. When that desire is rendered explicit, it becomes inherently unstable too disruptive and too terrifying to be rendered in words. Thus the queerness in these texts has to remain in the shadows, behind shutters or whispered between characters rather than being revealed to the audience. To borrow from Stephen King's Salem's Lot, quote, above all else, this, they did not look out their windows. No matter what noises or dreadful possibilities, no matter how awful the unknown, there was an even worse thing to look the Gorgon in the face, end quote. These trends persisted into the 20th century where motion pictures reinforced them and raised the stakes of subversion. With the introduction of the Hayes Code in the United States, the barrier gaze trope tended to be merged with and gained social traction through queer coding. Briefly, the Hayes Code, which gave rise to the MPAA and the film ratings that still grace our screens today, mandated that any character that demonstrated non-heterosexual tendencies had to be a villain, and thus most villains tended to be queer. Before this, queer characters and themes were popular in silent films because of their overt physicality, which played very well in silent movies. Queer characters also offered comic relief, not specifically as the butt of jokes, but often because they were characters who could identify, identify the flaws and foibles of the other characters around them. Often queer characters queered their storylines by breaking the fourth wall or by providing an audience with a guide to understanding the power dynamics of a story. By their running or shrinking from a villain through their willingness to help a heroine or to flirt with a hero, each action that a queer character performed indicated to an audience to where they should direct their sympathy, even when the characters themselves remain confused or morally dubious. Within this new framework of artistic production, queer characters became the villains and all physical activity that identified them as allies to the audience became the way by which they were identified as antagonists through their campiness, their arch delivery, and through their monologues of exposition before actually carrying out their dastardly plot. They became physical, corporeal manifestations of plot devices. And I wanna put an extra emphasis on that corporeality. These are two examples um, that I use in my teaching that I, I think portray these really well. Um, on the right-hand side of the slide, uh, you have Maleficent, my beloved, um, who is the uh, antagonist of Disney's Sleeping Beauty. Uh, she is a gray-skinned woman with yellow eyes. Uh, she wears a black cloak with uh, purple lining. She has two black horns and she has a pet crow with an elongated yellow beak who is sitting on her knee. On the left-hand side, you have Donald Pleasance playing uh, Blofeld in the James Bond films. He's a white man with a bald head on an injury to his right eye um, that causes scarring around it. And he's holding on to a fluffy white cat, both of whom who are looking at the screen. 
Even after this period of self-censorship ended, queer coding remains in our films and our stories, showing villains as sexually perverse or depraved, as monstrous in their performances of their gender and sexuality, or through their isolation and inability to form meaningful relationships with other characters. And I think we can also think about the relationship to animals among the villains shown here, um, because they are shown as unable to form empathetical bonds with anyone else around them. So while characters like Buffalo Bill and Silence of the Lambs present an outside example, outsized example rather, of this kind of post Hays code queer coding, um, I would like to look quickly at the Insidious franchise for the way it plays into some of our themes today, especially the second film in the series, Insidious 2. Uh, in this film, Patrick Wilson's Josh Lambert is possessed by the bride in black, to whom we were very briefly introduced in the first film. Um, the, the actor playing the black bride in the first film is male. Uh, he's an actor named Philip Friedman. And because the scenes featuring the bride were so short and cut so rapidly, it's very difficult to see who the figure is behind the dress and the veil. And you can kind of see here that it is the aesthetic of the bride rather than um, the actual embodiment that is so frightening. However, over the course of Insidious 2, we find out that this bride is or was Parker Crane, a gender confused man who was driven insane by his abusive mother uh, who desperately wanted a daughter. This film calls on tropes from Psycho, The Shining, and Sleepaway Camp, while actively perpetuating the harm that these tropes do, particularly to trans audience members. And we can see uh, in this slide, there are two images of Parker Crane. On the left, uh, we see him as a child wearing a dress and interacting with a white actress with dark hair, who is his mother, uh, who is very heavily made up with something of a corpse-like appearance and wearing a white dress. On the left-hand side, it's an extreme close-up of Parker Crane as an adult while he is applying his makeup. So he is a white-skinned man with very heavy white makeup on and very heavy mascara over his green eyes. At the same time, once Parker Crane becomes identified, the fundamental theme of the films change. We shift from a haunting, which is the theme of the first Insidious film, to a possession in the second, because the corporeality of the villain is now of paramount importance in a way that it was not in the first film. For so long, queer characters were the monsters that had to be destroyed, that it appears impossible feat to imagine them living fulfilling lives on their own terms, having hearts or souls, or thriving peace of, peacefully into old age. Scholars also argue that the AIDS crisis further compounded this trope. Most obviously, the spectacular nature of the disease made it easy to distinguish the quote, queer characters and provided a straightforward and moralistic reason for their demise. Now, when I say spectacular, I mean the highly visible symptoms and suffering of people with AIDS, exacerbated by media reports that emphasized their quote, corpse-like appearance and fetishized the sexual practices that led to infection. Thus, while there was now the potential to portray queer characters in a positive light, their inevitable death ensured that order would eventually be restored to the heterosexual world outside of these stories. The tragedy and trauma of AIDS likewise made it an impossible feat to discuss rationally. AIDS itself became the specter or spirit within the quote, dead house of a queer body. With a generation of queer mentors, leaders, and individuals gone or chronically ill, it again became nearly impossible to imagine queer characters living fulfilling lives on their own terms, having hearts or souls, or thriving peaceably into old age. And there are three images on this slide um, that highlight some of the themes that I've just discussed. One of them is Tom Hanks, uh, who is uh, starring in Philadelphia, which is a movie about an uh, HIV positive individual uh, going to court. So we see Tom Hanks very thin uh, without hair and a Kaposi sarcoma scar on his forehead. On the bottom is a black and white picture of activist David Kirby as he was dying. Uh, he's surrounded by his family who are all white individuals. He is laying in a bed 
and uh, is Christ-like in his appearance, not only because of his long brown hair and beard, uh, but because of the look of suffering on his face. Uh, this picture was actually used by the United Colors of Benetton in several ads um, and became a very well-known uh, meme surrounding the suffering of AIDS patients. And the last is a cover from Time Magazine that identifies in bold red letters, now no one is safe from AIDS and shows images of a young child, a heterosexual family and the military, all of which were now sites of infection that were previously thought to be impossible because AIDS was categorized as a disease of outsiders. Yet while all these explanations help us understand why queer characters don't get to be fully human in the stories we tell, none of them explain why there aren't any or enough queer ghosts in the stories that we tell. There are plenty of heterosexual ghosts, property owning ghosts, ghosts with jobs, ghosts who pine for their lost loves, who seek revenge on a spouse or a partner that did them wrong, or who offer testimony that reveal hidden but vital truths about the world around them. Usually a heteronormative, heterosexual capitalist world. They have power in the physical and tangible world, even if it is only to rattle China or make the lights flip on and off, as well as in whatever realms they might inhabit. And I think in, rec in recognizing what makes ghosts so important to our stories, horror or otherwise, we may be getting closer to answering our question about that lack of queer ghosts. All the tropes I've considered here, the barrier gaze trope, which I would expand to consider the quote, dead lesbian syndrome in literature, or the kill your queers trope in modern media, queer coding, the specter of HIV and corporeal illness, all reduce queer bodies to just that, bodies. They are stock characters or plot devices who have no, and indeed require no, interiority. This fetishization or hyperfixation on the physical nature of queerness wholly overlooks the emotional, psychological, and spiritual realities of life for queer people and within queer identities and communities. We see this even today in legislation that sees queerness and transness as physical qualities and threats to be reduced, especially to children, without concern for the actual lived experiences of individuals of any age who are being harmed by public discourse as well as by the laws themselves. Anti-trans and homophobic narratives rely on the physicality and corporeality of members of the LGBTQIA community. And if we are not encouraged to think of queerness as anything other than bodily, how can we imagine queer spirits? The end of Killing Eve, like the end of Dorian Gray, like John's end in The Hunger, our last glimpse of our queer lead characters is that of a corpse. And this issue of corporeality recalls two pieces for me by Michael Elias that appeared in Catapult, which discussed the relationship that many queer individuals have to their bodies and the emphasis on corporeality that is both defining and hindering for them. Uh, Elias explains, quote, not everyone can distinguish between their bodies and themselves. Not everyone knows that existing in a body can be like an optical illusion, where if you look hard enough, you begin to see a different shape take form, end quote. Here we see a new image of a queer body as a vessel from which something else or something more can emerge, as well as an image that emphasizes how social norms, cultural history, and media representation continue to limit the potential of queer people, both their corporeality and their intentionality. Elias continues, and this quote comes up on the slide as well, quote, to embody consists of the active to inhabit and the passive to be inhabited. Like the presence of ghosts, which haunt only if someone is haunted, embodiment is a necessary combination of the physical and the metaphysical. How can I summarize this idea to someone who has never considered their existence in a body as an act of embodiment, end quote. In order to portray our queer characters fully, we must recognize and wrestle with all that resides within them, not only their own personality and character, but their history, their emotional ties to others, to their places of belonging and to their own history that need to appear on stages, screens, or pages. 
Another issue that arises for me in thinking about all this is where we find gay voices from the past. This is part and parcel for me of the issue of queer corporeality. Queer history is challenging to construct, especially if our subjects do not describe their physical encounters in clear or precise enough language for their meaning to be understood across cultures. Jokes abound about historians' descriptions of Virginia Woolf's, quote, close friendship with Vita Sackville West, or about two people who lived in the same house for decades, shared finances and meals, and died in each other's arms as, quote, roommates. Here again, we are denied a close, compassionate interpretation of queer pasts or the potential of allowing these figures to speak for themselves in our present, however ambiguous that speech might be. These same influences also make it impossible to know the full impact of grief and loss in the stories that we tell, essentially. One of the most important aspects of understanding a ghost is to understand the implications of their life. To change death certificates because of HIV AIDS, whether that means changing the name or the real cause of death, obscures our ability to know our queer ancestors in our immediate past. The abandonment of their bodies through disposal or anonymous burial also prevents us from accessing their corporeal or their physical existence. One of the most important aspects of a ghost story is the moment where a ghost's name and story is known, thereby divining its purpose. If we cannot do one, how can we do the other? I do want to note uh, kind of in closing, there we go, that we have seen a move towards the acknowledgement of queer haunting uh, in several pieces. The first is Mike Flanagan's The Haunting of Bly Manor, uh, which is set in the eponymous Bly Manor in the UK and follows the experiences of a young au pair, Danny Clayton, who was hired by Henry Wingrave to look after his niece and nephew over whom he has recently had to assume custody. While at Blind Manor, Danny experiences a number of uncanny events and specters and also falls in love with Jamie the gardener. On the left-hand side of the slide, you can see um, Jamie and Danny, who are two white women, one with blonde hair and one with brown hair. Um, and in the background of this slide is the one of the film stills from the poster of The Haunting of Blind Manor, which shows a white woman with dark hair wearing a nightdress standing in a body of water in front of a Victorian Gothic manor. Now, again, I'm dancing around spoilers here, but suffice it to say that by the story's end, uh, Jamie and Danny have experienced tragedy and only one of the two women sleeps in a bed being watched over by the other who refuses to leave her side. The presence of this ghost is an important one and I don't want to discount that. However, I would also argue that this series cannot wholly escape Henry James's own internalized homophobia and thus is forced at many times to reduce its queer characters to what Jordan Loma calls mononormativity, a specter of singularity that is quote, closed and restricted. Loma argues that the ghosts of Bly Manor, especially the Lady of the Lake, is a figure who represents nothing but rage, a singular emotion or a monodirectional force. Thus, when one of the characters invites the Lady of the Lake into themselves, a form of both haunting and possession that we can dissect, uh, in order to save the manor, they also invite that mononormative impulse into them, embracing, quote, the failure of what she was expected to be end quote. The love between the living and the dead remain, and that is important, but this ghost is not one who has a voice, who has agency, or has a narrative of their own. Instead, they become the embodiment of the house or of another's desires. Again, with the loss of corporeality comes the loss of subjectivity. The second example is one that has nothing at all to do with horror, so we'll kind of come full circle, um, but that is the ways in which ghosts are portrayed in the FX show Pose, which is a historic drama that focuses on the ballroom culture of the 1980s and 90s. Following its debut in 2018, Pose provided a stylized primer and a critical corrective on American queer history, focusing on the lives and relationships of people of color in the LGBTQ community. By inserting these characters into the most important moments, places, and discussions of the time period, Pose offered a diversity seldom acknowledged in historical sources of the time. Just as, just as importantly, the show also provided emotional closure for its characters, 
offering the insight, answers, and dignity denied to so many people who actually took part in these historic events. In addition, Poe's provided its characters with a unique kind of privilege in the form of allowing them to return as ghosts. And we can see several instances of that here, each of which focuses on a character named Candy, who is a black woman uh, in, dressed in red in all of these shots um, with a curly black hair um, and is talking to other characters in her spirit form. Um, Pose gave its characters, especially Candy, the chance to speak to their beloved left behind. On the left-hand side of the slide, you can see her talking to Angel, uh, who is a light-skinned black woman with curly brown hair, to share in their joy, to offer important messages that provided both the living and the dead with closure and comfort, and also to help living characters deal with their own grief and insecurities. Candy returned after her brutal murder in season two to say goodbye to her friends and to share a moment of solidarity with her father. She also appeared to Pray Tell, another character who was hospitalized for an HIV related infection in the episode, Love's in Need of Love Today. And this episode met with a lot of um, discourse on social media around the ways in which Candy and Pray Tell discussed issues of suicide, uh, resiliency, and what it means to go on living in a world that is not welcoming. Um, in this slide, you can see Candy um, at the bottom as she is portrayed as a ghost looking uh, very glamorous with lots of makeup and shiny earrings. And at the top is a tweet that I found from a Pose viewer uh, who notes, quote, Candy's ghost is starting to annoy me only because I would have loved to see more of her story when she was alive. And I think this gets to the heart of why we need more queer ghosts, because they cannot be read as monoliths, as this show informs us, whether our representations are uh, entirely uh, without problem or blame, they um, instead raise the issue of ghosts as physical presences, taking up space in our minds, our hearts, and in our day-to-day -day lives. They also represent a forms of queer history and kinship, forcing us to remember that those who are died continue to live on in our memories, continue to have influence, and continue to speak to us as we find our way in a world that is not welcoming. These ghosts also form a representation of trauma, grief, defiance, and hope, not only in their presence, but through the conversations they carry on with living characters. And finally, they form a lens through which the living recognize themselves. In this particular scene under debate, Candy represents a manifestation of Pray Tell's deepest fears, emphasizing that ghosts can also represent the slipperiness of memory, the cruelty of grief, as well as issues of personal truth. So in a world where AIDS is no longer a fatal disease or one that even need impact life expectancy, should one have doctors, access to doctors, medication and support, the grief and trauma of that period has been overshadowed by what Sarah Shulman calls the gentrification of the mind. A process not only of erasing queer communities from urban areas with high rent constructions, but also of sanitizing queer history to make it palatable for mainstream consumption. As the bodies of our heroes and our family members die away or are hidden beneath the ground, the con this gentrification continues to override the pain, love, fear, and all the other messy emotions that bind us together in a shared human experience. All those same emotions that animate ghosts. I would argue then that the presence of queer ghosts offers the potential for a unique kind of haunting, the kind of haunting that Avery Gordon describes as learning to see, quote, what is usually invisible or neglected or thought by most to be dead and gone, to imagine beyond the limits of what is already understandable, end quote. In this sense, queer ghosts represent not merely the essence of a person who is no longer animating a corporeal form, they represent all the stories that have been silenced over time and all the forms of existence that normal media have rendered invisible. In thinking through the implications of why queer death must be final, why queer bodies are seen as both dead and empty, and how our current, current culture reinforces these norms, 
I sincerely hope I have raised more questions than I have answered and created a space for us to think about and listen to the voices that have remained silenced too long. Thank you all so much for your time. And I'm just gonna end briefly with a slide in case you didn't get my contact information or you would like more uh, information about the horror studies program for which I work. Thank you.